All right, welcome to the Freedom Unchained channel. This is a uh, lesson, probably the actual beginning of teaching by George Gordon. And um, I just want to put my little uh, disclaimer in there that these are not my thoughts. My thoughts are always, always, and always will be uh, evol evolving. And as I collect information and I get uh, more knowledge, then my uh, beliefs change, which all men's beliefs should be um, doing that. If you're not uh, changing your beliefs every day, then you're not learning and uh, you're just following uh, like a little sheeple and you're probably an indoctrinated uh, slave or person. So that's what I wanted to talk about. He uh, speaks in this video about natural persons and I believe uh, persons cannot be natural. A person is a uh, persona or if you go look up the etymology, or go on etymaline.com, look up what a person is or persona, it's a clay mask that they used on stages. So um, that is a person can, just can't be natural. Only man can be natural. So um, I would uh, replace what he's saying as a natural person, as man. But um, like I say with uh, pretty much everybody that you learn ideas from, everybody has a piece of the puzzle, they don't have the whole uh, puzzle piece or uh, the whole picture so um, don't take all of this knowledge as a uh, fact or truth or being true uh, do take the information in and uh, study it and uh, think on it and uh, build your own uh, beliefs because that is what uh, common law is all about is your beliefs and how you believe things not what the government believes so I do believe he has a lot of good knowledge and has done a lot of good research and understands the uh, system that the Constitution put in place, but I believe that man is outside of the actual Constitution, and we have these rights because they're inherent, inherent and given to us by God, the uh, universe, and the government was only created to protect the system of common law that is, has already, you know, been put into place and been practiced on for uh, thousands of years. Since man learned how to come together and uh, self-govern, or create govern governments between men, we are now in the uh, world of self-governing. So I want you guys to keep in mind that the uh, idea of a court is not the same as the courts of the government. The governments have their own courts, they do their own processes to keep and manage themselves to protect our rights, and then they also give us a venue called a courthouse to conduct our courts, our personal courts. When we bring a case into a courthouse and we file it into the public, then it creates a court if there's a controversy. If there's not a controversy, then a court wouldn't form. It would just be our claim, our claim into the public. And then when another man comes in and says, your claim's wrong, then you have a controversy and that's what creates a court. But it is established by the claim. And as man, you want to be the highest thing on the totem pole on earth, then you would act as man, and uh, men can only appear in a common law court. Persons cannot appear. Corporations, fictional things, things that are made up by man that cannot voice and speak, cannot appear in a common law court. They appear in their own courts of their own societies like the united states is another association so they have their own rules for their courts that are created by man but fictional entities can appear and be rep represented and uh go and follow different rules than a common law court which is established by men based off of god's laws i just wanted to kind of clarify all of this once you guys start listening to this i don't want you to get the idea that uh persons are higher than man, maybe in, uh, I think he might be talking about within the United States Association, within the legal list, legal society of the United States, that they only conduct business with persons, and then they define a natural person as a, uh, you know, a flesh and blood speaking individual, that's a natural person, and you'll understand where he's coming from with the idea of natural persons is that they are um within the united states society they're the freest they're free they don't have no obligations to anything else so therefore 
Um, they are on the top of the pyramid and have uh, m exclusive rights over anything else that is created by the government. I hope that makes sense for you guys. If you guys have any questions, leave a comment. Let's get a conversation started. Smash the like button. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit the bell notification so you can get more videos like this. And let's get started with the, the beginning of Lessons 1's actual teaching from George Gordon, Commonwealth School. Your speaker, Bob Hallstrom. Well, all of you should have received the tape that we have now on our introductory into this course. And this is going to be your first lesson with us now. And we're certainly glad to have you with us. Before we can get into that, though, I need to give you a brief overview of the program. And I'm not going to go through the whole lesson outline with you, because you all have one of those, and it's been furnished in a package. It's our course outline. So I hope that you'll take the time to go through that course outline and to see where we're going. Now, we may not cover them in the sequence that it is on the piece of paper, but we'll get to all the subjects there. Now, before we can do that also, we have to have a common understanding on certain principles of law or certain principles of humanity or or certain principles of government. So that we're all on the same level, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the basic concepts of government. First of all, we have to understand the original nation of government, if you will. In other words, who was first and who was second. Our contention is that God created all things. Now, some people may discount that and say, there is no God, and for those people, I don't have any problems with that. That's your belief in the way that you want things to be in life. That's the way it is. But the next thing that came on the scene of any importance to us was man. Now, before man did anything, he had to have numbers, so far as governments are concerned. There had to be more than one person. They didn't have problems when there's just one or two people in a small civilization, and probably not with a half a dozen people, or maybe not even 12 or 15 people. But somewhere along the line, they started having interaction problems, social problems, and they had to do something about it. So they had to create some form of government in order to have a stable society, in order to have peace and order and this type of thing. So they created some form of government. And government then did certain functions, whether it be trash hauling or policing the area or making sure the wealth didn't uh, get over distributed to certain people, but governments had certain functions, whatever they were. And in order to do that, they had to have people. So then the government then had some, what we call today, bureaucrats bureaucrats. So all government employees, the way we look at it, are bureaucrats. Okay, so you have a general then outline of how government originated. Now in our country, it's a little bit different. We came over here with godly precepts back in the early and late 1700s, I guess. And then we decided we needed a government. Of course, we had man to do that. Man settled the country. And we created something called the Constitution as our law of the land. Now, Constitution and the word law are synonymous type words. Okay. From the Constitution, we created government. Government. The Constitution created government. Okay. From the government, then, we again have our bureaus. We have our bureaucratic people. So then the flow of power goes from God, man, Constitution, government, and the bureaucrat. Now, you've got to remember that that is the sequence. Red Beckman pointed this out kind of vividly in his book on juries. I like to look at it in this type of a sequence where you have a hand, God, man, constitution, government, and bureaucrats. Now, what's happened in our society over a period of 200 years is they just turned this plane over. Our bureaucrats are now controlling government, and government's controlling the constitution through man, and for the most part, they've eliminated God. So we've got a complete reversal. We've got just exactly what we didn't want when we came over here in the first place over 200 years ago. We've reversed our government. Now, let me just say how our government was supposed to originally function also a little bit. Now, I know this may be basic to some of you, but I've got to ensure that we're all on the same plane. Okay? We had an executive branch of government, we had a judicial branch of government, and we had a legislative branch of government. Now, your legislative government passed, passed the laws, if you will. don't like to use the word laws there because if it's a bad law, it still could be construed as a law rather than a statute and that type of thing. I don't want to get into those type of analogies. But here you have a judiciary branch of government, and they are more or less determine, determine what is and is not law. What 
what is and what is not law. And your executive branch is simply that that carries out the law. Carries out law. They're strictly an agency that enforces what the legislature, legislature passes. Now, of course, in the early days, we know about the common law, and all law wasn't made as a matter of record. It wasn't on the records. When they did that, they called them statutes. Statutes. The statutes were to reinforce the common law. They were to reinforce the common law, because the common law is an unwritten law. It wasn't written down as anything. Everybody understood the basic Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, and this type of thing. Thou shalt not commit adultery. They weren't necessarily written down. But when they did put them down in paper, we called them statutes at that time. Okay, so we have a, an executive branch of government over here that carries out law. We've got the legislature who's, who's making law, passing law, if you will, and the judiciary who's taking uh, the determinations of people and, and determining what is and is not law. And all law that's passed by legislature is subject to judicial review. And that's what we feel is our place to get redress of grievances right here in the courtroom. And that's what this course is all about. We're going to teach you how to function in this particular branch of government right here, the judicial. It's our opinion that these people don't know what they're doing and haven't for time immemorial almost. Somebody's got an interest that they have, they take it to the legislature, and what do they do? They pass a law. There ought to be a law. Driving down the road at 80 miles an hour and some fool passage at 140 and the guy gets upset. And there ought to be a law against that. And the next thing you know, there is a law against it. And that's just the way that works. Of course, then we get into the insurance programs and things like this. And everybody wants to make money, increase profits, and this type of thing. Well, the best way to do that is to get a monopoly going on your particular service or, or whatever it is that you're dealing with in business. Well, if you can do that through the legislature, you've got it made. For example, the insurance laws. The insurance is the biggest ripoff that there's ever been. And it's all sanctioned and done under this legislative branch of government. And then they've even went so far as to put the enforcement of the, of the insurance industry underneath the executive branch of government. Yeah, that's right. You've got to have a driver's license. You've got to have registration. You've got to have proof of what? Insurance. You've got to have proof of insurance. Here we go. If you don't have the insurance, who's going to get you? These guys. That's your policeman out here running around your executive branch of government. Here we pass the law. And we're doing it for the insurable interest of the insurance company, the claims window of the insurance company. We're not doing it because of the people. Now, you've got to remember the people are up here, too. You see, the people created that little document that goes in here called the Constitution. See, so we're not really doing this for the benefit of the people. We do that under the pretext of that. And we say that there's a public interest involved and the public morals are involved and everybody ought to have insurance to protect everybody else. But now we're running into some problems with that type of a function in that we are regulating regulating the right of a person. My wife's not here, so she's the good speller. Now, when she's here, I normally don't have these problems because she'll tell me right away, sweetheart, you can't spell, spell that differently. Since she's not here, I'll just have to suffer, and so will you. So we're going to rate the, the, regulate the right to obligation, obligation of what? Of contract. That's right. We're going to regulate your right to contract. In other words, we're not going to tell you who you have to contract with, but we're going to tell you that you must contract. And you must contract with some insurance company because you've got to protect everybody out here in society. Well, just looking at that just a little bit deeper, if you have a car, right? I drive a $400 car. I guess it's worth $400. I don't know. Maybe it's worth $200. But it's not worth a hell of a lot of money. Okay, and then my buddy over here, now he drives a Stingray Corvette, and I don't know what those things are worth now, but they're about, you know, they're way up here in the $18,000 bracket. He's worried about his car. He wants insurance. He goes out and buys his himself an insurance club policy because he wants to take care of that thing. My little $400 car, I don't care about it one way or the other. If I get in a wreck, you know, uh, it doesn't really bother me. I figure that in my last 20-some years of paying in insurance to companies just on cars and loan, it exceeds $26,000. And in all those years, I can't think of a claim that I've ever had. I've had a couple minor accidents, but both of them were under $100, and I just paid it out of my back pocket. Why? Because my insurance rates goes up. I don't want that. But I want to keep my insurance rates down. But yet I'm dumb enough that I've paid $26,000 over the last 20-some years. About $1,000 a year. I own several vehicles and boats and things like that. That's the way it goes. The more you own, the more you're going to pay those insurance companies. 
So, getting back to it here at the car, this guy has an interest in his vehicle of $18,000, and I've got one of four. So what I'm really doing when I buy insurance with my $400 car is I'm protecting the investment of this guy down here. And I'm protecting the investment of some other guy over here who's driving another, I don't know, 600 or 6,000 or whatever automobile. I'm not protecting my own automobile. I'm protecting his automobile and his interest. I'm insuring, insuring against a probability. And you do the same thing with life insurance. You just buy life insurance. You're just betting that you're going to die. And I don't know why people do that because you know, it's not a matter of betting that you're going to die. We know we're going to die. The only question is when. Okay? Well, that's a fact of life. Now, you can't determine, though, that you're going to have an automobile accident. As I was telling you, I've only had two that I can recall in the last 20-some years. And both of them were very minor. And they didn't cost me that much. So why do I, with my 400 automobile, want insurance to protect me against this guy? Well, you say it's against suits and lawsuits and this type of thing. Well, let me ask you this. If you don't have the insurance policy, how are they going to sue you for a million and a half dollars? Don't have it. Even if they got the judgment, you can't do it because you just don't have that wealth. So because you have the insurance policy, and of course the driver of the other car that you might hit over here with $100 worth of damage, and that's what we're talking about, I don't know what the average prices of uh, automobile accidents, but I don't think that they're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars. They're in the hundreds of dollars. They're small. So it really doesn't do much good for me to insure my car to protect this other guy's investment over here. i just rather pay it out of my pocket. But this guy's got a real problem. He wants his car protected. So what does he do? He buys an insurance policy also. Now, what he should be doing is paying for his, his car. His insurance policy, in my opinion, should cover him against damage from some fool like me who's running around in a $400 automobile. So that if I hit him, his insurance company will then pay the damages. Now, he is insuring his vehicle with an insurance company against any damages from whatever source. If he wants to protect his property, he should insure it from people like me that don't have insurance. Why should I be required to protect myself or his vehicle from a damage from me. So you see, you can look at everything from two different angles. But I'm just saying, when you buy insurance, you're insuring the equitable interest of almost every other person that's out there on the road. Contrary to life insurance, where you're just insuring yourself. You're, you're betting that you're going to die. I'm going to die, and I'm going to buy this $20,000 or $100,000 life insurance policy. So I'm just trying to show you here how you regulate now private industry through the legislation. I'm sure you're all aware of how that works, at least basically. This is how I see it anyhow. So now we've got a basic concept then of government being started by the people. They wrote a constitution. We have three separate branches of government. Okay, each function, of, the functions of each separate branch of government cannot intertwine or lap over. The judiciary branch cannot write legislation and pass bills. The legislature cannot issue warrants for arrest. Is that the way that works? Well, that's the way it's supposed to work. And we do have some problems with that in practice. We know that the IRS is over here. And the IRS issues administrative summonses. Well, are those valid summons? Absolutely not. When people go to them? Yeah, they do. Can they get out of it? Yeah, they don't have to. But then they'll have to go get a judicial summons to get you in, and they're known to do that. I'm just telling you, though, this, this IRS capacity over here in the executive branch is in the wrong place. It's got to be over here. If it's not over here, it's in the wrong place, and it's null and void, and that act can't be. That's just the way we've set up our government. Now, what we've created, though, let me get rid of some of this mess I've got up here on the board, is a different animal altogether. We've created something out of our government that's just uh, almost total foreign and alien. We now still have this legislative branch of government over here, and they're passing laws, all right. They're still doing that. Statutes, whatever you want to call these things, code. Most states now have what they call a uniform code. Uh, which is nothing more than the will of the legislature, if you look those definitions up, and we'll get into that when we get into the classes on statutes, codes, and this type of thing. But you've got a monster over here. Over here, you've got everything from soup to nuts. Good Lord, you've got the HEW, you've got your transportation. Uh, gosh, the list, I just, was so mind-boggling, I'm not even going to be able to write them all down. But just think of a few of them that you've got over here. And we've got also in our system here in Idaho, what we call a prosecuting attorney. And he's supposedly in the executive branch of government. Okay? Let's talk about that guy just a second here to show you how this system screwed up. In Idaho, this guy is found over here in Article 5. 
Article 5 to our state constitution. Well, Article 5 in the state constitution of Idaho means that that's the judiciary branch of government. So we've got our prosecuting attorney listed under Article 5 in the judiciary. And yet, they claim that this guy's an executive branch of government. See, when you go into the courtroom, you've got a judge sitting up here on a bench. And you've got a couple people down here as your adversary system of justice. Here you've got the defendant, and over here you've got the state. And that's the wrong term, too, and I shouldn't use that. You've got the people. In a criminal matter, you've got the people. Okay, well, who represents the people is the next question. Well, if you read your law books, it should be a man called a public prosecutor okay public prosecutor he should be an executive member of the state he should be appointed appointed by the executive i mean how can this guy up here being the governor execute his prime function of carrying out the laws of the state if he can't prosecute somebody he can't arrest and prosecute in many states the state of idaho does have an idaho state police force we've got city police and county sheriffs and all that other thing but this guy's held responsible for upholding these laws over here. And if he can't prosecute in a court of law, then he can't do that, can he? Well, who does it? Well, in our state, it's the attorney general. And every state may be a little different, so I really don't know. I'm just going to have to speak to you in generalities. Or the prosecuting attorney. You know, I just told you that the prosecuting attorney is under the judicial branch of government, so we've got a real problem. Because the people must be represented by the executive branch of government. Not by the judicial, not by the legislative. They have separate functions. Somebody over here has got to prosecute in the name of the people, and that's got to be your public prosecutor. It's the only guy it can be, and he must be appointed member of the executive branch of government. And I don't think that there's a state in this union that's got a public prosecutor. And if it is, it would surprise me to hear that. Because everybody who's over here is represented by either a city attorney or the prosecuting attorney or whatever they call them, or they have different names in some states, or the Attorney General. Okay? Those are the three animals that end up handling that action for the people of the state. Okay? City Attorney, Prosecuting Attorney, Attorney General. City Attorney is a member of a municipality. He's not a member of the executive branch of government. He's a municipal corporation. For most parts, I, there's only one city in the whole state of Idaho that's still under a charter basis. So all these guys are what we call imposters. They're not executive members. They're part of a corporation. And they're bringing private interests into here in a criminal action. We're speaking criminally here, incidentally. I'm talking about a criminal action, not a civil action. Okay. An attorney general is elected by the people of the state. We actually vote in our attorney general here. Now, I don't know what happens in your state, but in our state, we vote him in. But yet, if you ask this guy a question, he's going to tell you, I don't have anything to do with that. I can't give you legal advice. I'm here to advise the judicial, or not the judicial, but the legislative branch of government and the executive branch of government. If they have problems, I'll represent them or give them legal advice. Now, the governor up here cannot tell that attorney general what to do, because the attorney general is elected by the people. The people should tell him what to do, but yet he's still not responsive to the people. So we've got some real problems here, as you can see, with our government. Well, the same thing is true with the prosecuting attorney. In Idaho, you can only have five officers in county government. And one of those are not a prosecuting attorney. And it says, thou shall be no other county officials in there. Okay, well, where did this guy come from? Well, he's over here in the judiciary. So then our legislature over here, assuming the power that they have, they go ahead and pass a statute saying that this guy is a county officer. Well, it can't be. The Constitution of the state of Idaho says there are only five and there shall be no others. But they just took it upon themselves and violated the Constitution and made this guy prosecuting attorney county officer. So again, we have a problem with our government. We cannot have a properly set court in the state of Idaho in a criminal action. And I don't know how your state is. Now, we've got a brief on that. And as we progress in this, you're going to hear about these types of briefs. Okay, I want to get away from this now. But I just wanted to give you some idea so that we all have a basic understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about a government and how it's supposed to function or maybe not how it's supposed to function or at least how it functions. Now, we're going to try to teach you in this course how to function in that courtroom. That courtroom, we feel, is the most important part of any person's existence. If you can't go in there and talk, then you're going to get laid away. If you're going to hire an attorney, we feel that that's the kiss of death. Now, there's some good attorneys out there, but in using an attorney, you just lost your jurisdictional issue over the person. Because when they go in there representing you, then the court has the jurisdiction. And as far as we're concerned, jurisdiction is one of the biggest clubs and the biggest arguments we have. And you just forfeit it with that attorney, so we don't want an attorney. We want to go in there and we want to talk on behalf of myself. 
And we call that in propria persona. In propria persona. And you can look that up in your legal books. The Supreme Court understands those words because they had a case on it back in the 1800s. So now I want to get on and talk about status. And one thing I, more I do want to illustrate to you is <clears throat> we have found that almost every organization and every group that we have ever talked to, and we talked to them from Alaska, Philadelphia, Texas, California, Colorado, and just about all over the states, they all have good information. The Golden Mean Society is another one. They all have the right information. The biggest problem that we find is having knowledge up here and being able to use it are two different things. And you can know everything that there is, and if you can't use it, it doesn't do any good. To illustrate that, you know, this is nothing more than a gun. That's all it is. It's a gun. The thing is absolutely functionless because it, it can do nothing of its own volition. It just can't. It takes a human being, such as myself, to act the same. This particular thing is unloaded. It's just, but it's still nothing. It's still nothing. It can't function. Now, you can pull the trigger and do anything you want to it, and it still won't function. See? So I have a gun, and I know it's a gun, and I know it serves a purpose, but it will not function until certain actions happen. And you have to take something called bullets, you have to insert them into the gun, engage the gun, ensure that the safeties are off, then depress the trigger, and this thing will function. Okay? So knowing how to do something is not necessarily being able to use it. Everybody knows that a gun will kill, right? But if you don't know how to use the gun, it won't do you any good. Well, it's the same way with law. If you know something is right or wrong, and for example, income tax, you know that you don't have to pay it, but the problem is you don't know how to get out of it. So knowing how, knowing that your person not required to file doesn't do you any good at all, because you don't know how to quit filing. You don't know how to quit making your return. Okay. Now I'm going to start, I'm going to be covering a few words. I'm going to write them over here on this right-hand side. Some of the things that I'm going to be covering is the word citizen. And down here at the bottom, I'm going to put a slave. Words like servitude. How about um, subject? Like I said, I can't spell my wife's not here. Member. Those are some good words. Subject, slave, corporation. That's an awful good word. That's a very important word in our society today because almost all law is based on corporate capacity rather than on uh, citizens up here. So those are basically some of the words I'm going to be covering. And I put these two in the top and the bottom, obviously, for the reason that they are different. I should talk about status first of all because that's the name of this class, is status. Okay. We base everything that we do in law upon our status. Everything that we do. We have, whether you like it or not, a class society. We have the higher ups, and you got the lower downs. And I don't know where they're at down here, but that's number 10. When I was in Vietnam, and things were good or bad. You're number one, it was all right. You're number 10, you're bad. So in our class society, we have the high class and the lower class, upper class and lower class, or whatever you want to call them. Now, our government has been trying to put us all on a neutral plane and saying that all persons are equal, and it's never been that way. It never has been that way, and it never will be that way. Russia tried that and said they're going to have a classless society, and we know it doesn't work. They've got the same problems with their society as every other society. You've got some people up here in the society and some people down here, and that's just the way it is, and you can't get away from it. Now, I'm going to read a bunch of definitions as I go through here and talk about some of these words, and the first one I'm going to talk about is the word status. And all of these words that I give you definitions from come from Bouvier's Law Dictionary, either 1870 or 1914. Now, we use Bouvier's for one good reason. It's the only book that has the sanction of Congress. It is a constitutional law book of the United States and was so enacted in 1870. Now, not in 1914, but it was expanded in 1914 from uh, two volumes to three volumes. You can get a two-volume book also in 1914. But those definitions are the definitions that were used at the time most of the laws were enacted that affect us today. And they were the words used when our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution of the United States were written. So in order to know what our fathers, founding fathers meant when they wrote those words, you have to have the dictionaries that also go back and define what those words meant at that time. Because we know by reading words today that they changed the meaning on the darn things. So you can't take a 1982 dictionary and an 1828 dictionary and get the same meaning out of the book because it changed the meaning of the words. 
And in order to understand the laws that was written at that time, you need to get the books at that time in order to stand, understand the intent of the people or the legislature that passed that. So we go back to the very beginning on this and find out what status is. So status then is the status of an individual used in a legal term means the legal position of the individual in or with regard to the rest of the community. So we can see right away by the definition of the word that there is a class society and you hold certain rank in that society. Okay. It's also considered the rights, the duties, the capacities, and there's some more good words. Rights, duties, capacities, and incapacities, which is even a funnier word. There's a good definition on that word incapacities, and I'll get to that a later. Which determine a person to a given class constitute in his society or in his status. <laughs> Constitute his status. Come here, we can't even read what's in front of me. Which determine a person to a given class constitute his status. Okay, that's what it says. Okay. So in other words, if you have certain rights and you have certain duties and you have certain capacities, the more of those you have, the higher your status would be on this status plane of zero to ten or wherever you want to go from one to ten. You've got to have these. Now what are rights and duties? Well the right to vote. Do all people have the right to vote? No. Can aliens vote? No. Are they citizens of our society? Yeah. Are they citizens of the United States? No. You see, you've got to look at it and you've got to ask some questions before you can determine that. And you walk down the street and you don't really know that because you can't pick out an illegal alien from a citizen in most cases, depending upon where he's from. And then you don't know that either because our society is so integrated with other racial cultures now that you have no way of knowing whether or not that person was a citizen or not. He could be an alien just as easily. But all citizens have certain rights, duties, and capacities or incapacities, however the case may be. Now, in our society, in the beginning, we all had this status. And we've moved from that status to a word called contract. How have we done that? Okay, well, we all had status because we all had certain rights and duties, and we all went down the road, we rode our horses and our carriages, and we didn't have any problems. Well, things got a little complicated, though, and you start having build-up areas, and you have more than one horse in the street, and there's ten horses in the street, and there's buggies in the street. And then some guy driving a buggy for hire comes along and, and wants to move people up and down the street and charge them for it. Then he runs over a kid with his wagon. Well, the guy doesn't know how to drive the wagon, and so then we've got to teach him, and then we've got a, got a problem in licensing and this type of thing. So when we start this license program, you know, you're getting into this contractual basis. So now you've got several things in your life. What's that? Marriage license, right? Everybody's got a marriage license. Everybody's got a driver's license. Everybody gets a building permit. You know, the list goes on and on. You want to hook up sewer, lights. You know, just the list goes on and on and on. Almost everything you do to nowadays depends on some contract with somebody. You get your gas hook up, got a contract. Can't turn your lights on, got a contract. You want to buy a car, got a contract. You want to own a home, you got a contract. See, everything's been done contract. The more of these contractual arrangements you have, the less of your status in society. The only person that can have the absolute status close up there, I say, wife over here, would be this person over here. And that's a citizen. And he has the status. The highest status you can have in our country would be called a pure, or free, and natural person or a natural citizen. Anybody else is less than that because they're tied down with all kinds of binding contracts. And that limits their freedom. They must perform on these contracts. And all contracts have something in them called specific performance. Specific performance. Okay. We've got a judge over here in our third judicial district that talked about these very words on the driver's license issue. He said, my goodness, she had the driver's license, and, and as such, she is required to perform specifically. He turned the words around a little bit. Required to perform specifically. That's right. You've got the driver's license. You've got a contract. Now, we've asked that question several times, whether or not a driver's license is a contract, and we've never got the response that it is, and that's because it isn't. And we've got about a 32 or 35 page brief on that very subject of telling you that a license is not a contract. But a license causes certain things to happen. Okay? 
And we consider them to be evidence evidence of consent. Another good term for that is called quasi-contract. Okay, quasi-contract. Now, it doesn't meet the terms of a quasi-contract. It doesn't meet the word terms of a quasi-contract at all. But it does meet the terms of what we call evidence of consent. And I can't think of anything else to term these licenses with. It's just evidence of consent. What you do when you go get a driver's license or any other time of license is say, I am consenting to be regulated under in the state of Idaho Title 49 on my driving on the roads. In other words, I don't have any capacity to function out there and I need somebody to watch after me and then I want the executive branch to do that and I want their policeman to catch me if I'm doing wrong and punish me accordingly. So therefore, I'm going to get that driver's license and I'm going to enter into a privilege. Privilege. And that's what they keep telling you. It's a privilege to drive on that road. Well, it's not. It's a right. It's a right to drive on that road and it's the right of personal liberty called locomotion. And if you look up personal liberty, I'm not going to cover that with you today, but look that word up, personal liberty. You'll find that it's a right. You have the right to move from one point to another without hampering, without being hampered, unless you're going to cause damage to some other party. If you're not causing damage to another party, they can't stop you from moving. Now, there's got to be certain restrictions. You can't go through guys' crops and things like that. But if you want to go from here to wherever your seat of government is, it can't stop you. You've got the right to go there, and I don't care whether you've got the driver's license or your car is registered or not. Now, they can't restrict the manner in which you go there. You can say, well, they can regulate it. Well, they can regulate it if you're assuming a privilege and got the driver's license up here because that is your evidence of consent to be regulated. And you've given up a right and now assume the privilege to drive on that road. You owe nothing to your government. Absolutely nothing. The state government has no hold on you whatsoever. And that's in a case called Hale versus Hinkle, and I'll cover that a little bit later. If you're a sovereign citizen, you don't have any allegiance to that state from the standpoint of obeying contractual arrangements. Can they force you into a contract? Can they force you to accept a driver's license? And then can they force you to pay for it? Well, if you fall into that trap, I guess they can, and you're going to buy it. And that license is nothing more than, running out of word here, space here, a license is also evidence of tax. It's evidence of tax. Okay, it's nothing more than evidence of tax. You go out there and you pay for a license fee for your driver's license or for your registration on your car, and they give you a piece of paper. It's not a license for that vehicle, it's just a receipt for a tax. And the proof that you've paid for your tax is the plate that you stick back on the car. Now we get into a problem with who can we tax. I really don't want to cover all those areas today, but you can see how you become limited. Who can you tax on that road? Can you tax me to drive on my road? Am I subject to a direct tax on my property? And that would go for your property as uh, land as well as your personal property. I shouldn't use the word personal property, but your property such as cars, snowmobiles, trailers, and things like that, boats. Can they tax that type of property? Whose property is that? Is that yours? If you don't pay the tax, do you lose the right to use your property? So you've got to figure these things out. If you want the privilege of doing that, well, you just go right down and register those things, get your license, and go ahead. But in doing that, you're giving up your rights, and you're accepting privileges, and you've got to understand that. That's why we say the status is important. But once you sacrifice those things, it's hard to get them back. We've tried out here to get rid of our driver's licenses. We turn them in. We've got affidavits. And I'm just telling you, the government won't accept them. They won't accept them at all. And they give them back to you. And they put it in their little computer. Then they stop you out there in the road and say, well, you've got one. It's just expired. And you're not carrying it with you. So now I'm going to give you a ticket for failure to carry. Well, now, see, we've got another problem. Can you make a man carry something in his pocket? Can you make him carry evidence? Well, I guess if you've got the license, you can make him carry it. But once he's refuted it, can you still make him carry that license? Well, i got some real problems with that. Same with the building permit. Can you make a man get a building permit to build on his own land? Just how far do you want to go with this? It can go on and on and on. It's got to stop somewhere. Either a man has the right to own property and to use his property, or he doesn't. If he doesn't have the right to own property and use his property, then he's nothing more than the feudal system as we were in England. And that's basically where we're at today. We're back to a feudalistic type system and where everything that we do, we're granting our power back to our state government and saying, you have all the rights and I don't have any, 
and I'm going to petition you to drive on your roads. Therefore, I'm going to get this driver's license. And it's the same way with marriage. I'm tired of living out here with this woman. I want some contractual arrangement. See? So therefore, I'm going to apply for a marriage license. And I'm going to let the state enter into a third party agreement, a third party in this arrangement. So now we have the state, the man, and the woman involved. Now, any two parties can dissolve that contract. See, any two. Whoops. <laughs> Not quite any two. The state and the man can, or the state and the woman can. The man and the woman can't negate the contract because the state's a party of interest and they're the prime party of interest because they're the ones that issued you a piece of paper. So the state always has to be one of the two parties of interest in that contract, even though there's three of you involved. See how that works? You gave up your right to marry and give it to the state, and you invested that right or into the state in saying that, yeah, you can license people out here to get married. If you don't have a license, you can't get married. Well, that's garbage, and we both know that. Okay, that's the way that whole licensing thing works. And that sort of tells you why you don't have any status anymore in our society. You delegated that status to everybody, well not to everybody, but to your state government or your federal government and these laws. Before we get away from the word status, there's just a couple more things I want to cover. Status may yield ground to contract, but cannot itself be reduced to contract. On the other hand, contract has made a tax on property which have been repulsed. Now, this is an important thing here to look at. Status may yield ground contract. Now that's what we've been doing when we listed all these licenses up here. You had status, but you yielded to contract. You decided that you wanted a contract, and you went to your government, and you petitioned them, and you got the marriage license, or you got the building permit, or you got whatever it is that you wanted. So you yielded your status, your personal status, to that of a contract. And you did that of your own volition. But now it goes on to say that contract has made a tax, but they have been repulsed. Because if you stand back and demand your rights and demand your status, it overrules the contract. But you've got to negate those contracts. And that's difficult to do once you're into the contract. Okay? A man's state, then, is his measurable property. And what he called his status is his position as a lawful man, a voter, and so forth. So you can see that you have status in life based upon your lack of contract, I guess. And the less contracts that you're into, the more free you would be and the closer you would be to becoming what we call a free man. Now this word free man is a neat term and we pick it up right out of the Constitution of the United States. Now you have one of these and it was put in the book for you so you should everybody should have a copy of the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. And I'm reading from page one of the Constitution of the United States and we're talking about representation and direct taxes. And it says here, numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years. Well, who are these people bound to service for a term of years? Apprentices, among others. So they recognized that some people were free and other people were not free. They were bound. They were into some sort of servitude or apprenticeship. They could sell themselves. So they were not free persons, and they had different rights than a free person did. Okay. So now we're through with the word status, and we're going to move on to the word person. As what is a person? The 14th Amendment has probably clouded that issue more than any other thing since we've had our Constitution. But the word person is, de is defined as a man considered according to the rank he holds in society with all the right to which he places, he holds and titles him, and his duties to which it imposes. Okay, so a man then has a rank in society. Now, I told you earlier, I believe, that we do have a ranking society. We are not all a monolithic society. We're not all on one even plane. We all have rank according to our status. Okay? Every citizen is a person. Other human beings, namely subjects who are not citizens, may be persons. But not every human being is necessarily a person. For a person is capable of rights and duties, and there may well be human beings have no legal rights. Well, certainly we have people in our society today that still don't have any legal rights. And where are they? Well, they're in the penitentiary, or they're in the jail, or they've sold themselves into bondage. They're working for the government, or whatever it might be. But every citizen is a person, but not every person is a full citizen, if you can understand that. There, can some, there may be some subjects out there who are not persons. So now we've got to find out what a subject is, and that's another word. So I'm going to move over here to the word subject and find out, since I just mentioned that definition. A subject is an individual member of a nation who is subject to the laws. Well, you mean you can have somebody who's not subject to the laws? 
This term is used in contradistinction to the word citizen. So now we know right away that citizen is the number one status in life. If you're a citizen, you've got the highest status you can have. And that's a big important word. Citizen. That's it. That's what we want to be. We want to be free and natural citizens. We don't want to be slaves to our government or any other entity. But at the bottom of that totem pole is the word subject. Okay, the word subject. So now we could have several classes of people between citizens and subjects then. Subject being the highest or the lowest and citizen being the highest. Now we can have other statuses. Let's take another status such as the word member and find out what a member is now since these words are used in the definition. A member is an individual who belongs to a firm, a partnership, a company, or a corporation. Well, isn't that interesting? Yeah, once you join a partnership, once you go into business, or once you fall into some partnership or business entity like a corporation, you have assumed a lesser status. And that status is a member. A member. I want you to remember these words. They're important to you. That person becomes a member of another entity. He's a part of that partnership. He's got a group that he belongs to and he functions with, and he's re given up some of his rights and capabilities. Well, what has he given up? Well, let's take a corporation, for example. A corporation is bound to the state. Any corporation that's in existence is bound to uphold all the laws of the state, good, bad, or indifferent. And corporates must obey these laws even if they're unconstitutional. And we really don't know whether any law can be passed that is not constitutional for, to a corporation. We think that you can, lim you can uh, limit a corporation no end. I shouldn't say it that way. We think that you can pass a law pertaining to a corporation that will put it right out of business. You can tax it to death, you can limit it, you can restrict it, you can do anything you want to to it until you actually destroy that corporation. But you can't do that to a free and natural citizen. And therein being the difference. It's interesting also to note that a member is also a person who is a part of a legislative body. A legislative body, that's right. Your legislature then is not the sovereign. Your legislature is another one of these persons. It's a member. They are lesser than a citizen. And I've been asked myself why I don't run for the legislature. One of the reasons I give for that is why should I lose my status to become a lesser status? Why should I become a member in society when right now I'm a free and natural citizen? I would have to give up my status and some of my rights because now I'm up there representing the people. And I'm a slave to the people. And so therefore my actions cannot be what I want them to be, but they must be what those people want me to do that have elected me. And that is good and that is bad, of course. Now let's go back again to this definition on the word person. It also includes some other terms. A person is such, not because he is human, but because rights and duties are ascribed to him. Okay, now we're talking about a citizen now. A person has rights and duties. That's a citizen. He has rights. What rights do we have? Well, we've got, we got so many rights, we don't even know what they are. But if you look at your Constitution, some of them are outlined there. Look at your Declaration of Independence, and many of them are outlined there. But we don't have any idea. We started making a list one day, and we just, just ran out of paper. You can just list them and list them. But basically, they're the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And we all understand those terms. But those terms are broad terms and cover a lot of territory. In fact, they cover so much territory, again, you can't sit down with a piece of paper and list them all. The person, then, is a legal subject of substance. Now, legal subject or substance is the word, or substance. In other words, a man is substantive. He has substance in himself. Now, think about that. There's a lot of things that don't have substance, like the money that we carry in our back pocket. It's not substance, so therefore when I work for somebody, I'm giving substance. I'm giving of my time and my life in a period of time, eight hours a day or whatever it might be, to another entity or to another person to create, to do a service or something like that. I'm giving of my substance, of myself, and that's a substan substantive right that I have to do that. So my life is substance to me, and when I go to work for somebody or, or do a service for them, I want something in return for my substance. And I want money. I want gold and silver coin if I could get it, but I can't get it. But I want substance. And since I can't have gold and silver coin, the only thing I can do is turn to the nearest available thing that has value, or at least is a symbol of value, and that's dollars in the form of Federal Reserve notes. Now, I'm not going to get on the money issue right now, but we treat Federal Reserve notes as property. 
or in other words, property being a substance again. Property is substance. So if I was to trade my labor for a substance of land, if I was working off uh, for a master of some type, if I put myself in some type of servitude that I want this piece of land and I'll work for you for 20 years if you give me that land, and that guy would agree, well, at the end of the 20 years, I've got my substance in that piece of land that I've worked out, but I've given him my personal substance in return for that physical piece of land.